It is good to see you here this morning. We're thankful for your presence. If you have your Bibles, you'd be turning to the book of Ephesians. That's where we've been studying for a while now. Of course, this study began back in the book of Exodus, and I uh, hope that you can recall that we're talking to God's people about who they are and what God has done for them. That God had a people in the Old Testament, and God has a people in the New Testament. And who we are and what God has done is what's so critical to how we live and how we behave. And that's the second part of the book. And we saw the same thing in the Old Testament. Last week, we challenged, to some degree, those who struggle with the security of their salvation. And um, I, I, I would tell you very quickly, there was no harm intended. I appreciate the fact that well, one could struggle for a variety of reasons. The point ultimately was that you don't have to struggle, and that if you do struggle, you can overcome your struggle by learning what God has done and learning who God is, and then believing it. Some of the blessings we already mentioned were that they had redemption in Christ Jesus. That's chapter 1 and verse number 7. Paul says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, Paul talks about being saved by grace through faith. We have the grace of God and salvation. And then in chapter 2 and verse 13, he mentions that those who once were far off are now made near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the things that they lacked in chapter 2 and verse 12, they gain in Christ. We talked about redemption and salvation and citizenship, hope and fellowship and communion. And those blessings lead to the one we'll discuss this morning, the blessing of peace. Reconciliation brings peace. What is it? Well, if you were just to look up the word peace, the uh, Greek word would be erene or something to that effect, and it will mean peace or quietness, rest. That's what Strong says. Thayer has several definitions, and they uh, differ based on context. For instance, one he says, a state of national tranquility, exemption from the rage of war and havoc, a peace between individuals, harmony or concord as it relates to human interaction. And then there's security and safety and prosperity because of peace and harmony. They make these things safe and prosperous. He gets to the Messiah's peace, and he says the way that leads to salvation. And then he says this, of Christianity, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort it is. And that's a pretty good description of peace. And that's what we'll discuss this morning. And it's what every Christian should have. Because of that, the last definition is this the blessed state of devout and upright men after death. You know, because of the peace that Christ gives us now, we get peace even as we approach and pass through death. Peace. Three areas where Christ makes peace. These will be found in verses chapter 2, verse 14, beginning. It's number one, and here's the outline, peace with man peace with God, and peace with self. First, why do you need peace? To appreciate the need for peace, listen to some of the antonyms to peace. There would be words like war, agitation, agony, disagreement, anxiety, fighting, violence, uproar, disturbance, and rage. And I submit to you, on some level, in every one of those areas where Christ brings peace, that's what exists without him. Now, why does it do that? Well, go back to chapter 2 and read again verses 1 through 3. This was the state of the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul says of them, they walked in sin. That's the issue. Sin is the issue. 
And it's what's so significant about Paul saying, first to the Gentiles, you were dead in trespasses and sins. And then he says, we all walked in the course of this world, a spirit of the air that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. You did it, we did it, we all did. That's the issue. It's also what's so important about when we read verse 4 and verse number 5, but God, but God in His grace and in His mercy and His love, by grace you are saved. Last week we talked about 11 and 12, therefore remember. Now why would you remember that? Because that's the state you were in, and so you can appreciate, but now in Christ Jesus. You who are far off are made near. And the next thing that Paul discusses is the result of that is peace. The blessings of Christ, being in Christ, brings peace. Number one, Christ makes peace between man and man. Notice verse number 14 and 15. There Paul says, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity contained in the law of commandments and ordinances, so that in himself he might make of two one new man, so making peace. Now, you hear in those verses words like our, verse number 14, our peace. You also hear in verse number 15, two into one new man, and so making peace. That's one of the definitions. Peace between individuals, harmony, concord. The Jews and the Gentiles are the ones being discussed. And prior to Christ, they were at odds with each other. You remember the Samaritan woman, the woman who met Jesus at the well and the conversation that ensued? Among the things she said was this, how are you a Jew speaking to me, a woman of Samaria. Well, several things stand out, I suppose, to her that were out of the norm. Number one, he's a man, and I'm a woman. She says that. You're a man, I'm a woman, and you're speaking to me publicly. How are you doing that? Secondly, she says, and maybe even more importantly, maybe even firstly, she says, you're a Jew. How are you a Jew speaking to me, a Samaritan? Then she added, you know the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This word, no dealings, it means to associate with. You don't do that. To hold in common, to use jointly. It's one of the things I remember hearing as a child growing up. Somebody would say, you know, we don't, we don't, no, I don't deal with her. Mm -mm, we don't, I don't deal with him. Uh, we don't deal with them. You ever heard this expression? We don't deal with. Some people would say it this way, oh, we don't fool with them. The woman who is talking to Jesus is saying, you know better than this. Our two groups, we have no dealings with each other. Let me show you in Luke chapter 4 that it went beyond just not associating with Go back to Luke chapter 4, and notice that Jesus has gone into the synagogue in verse number 14, 16, rather, verse number 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was. This was customary for Jesus to do what? To enter the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And after he read the book of Isaiah, the prophet, it was handed to him. He begins to quote from it, verse number 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, and set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I can't imagine what it would have been like to have Jesus in your midst reading from the Old Testament prophet and then saying, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Verse number 23, he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we've heard done at Capernaum, do here in your home time as well. And then he started preaching. He said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own hometown, but I say to you in the truth. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarepta in the land of Zidon, a woman uh, who was a widow. And 
There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Now, as you read that, it, I don't know what it means to you one way or the other, but those are two accounts in the Old Testament. One can be found, 1 Kings 17, 18, when Elijah goes to the, to the woman who is a widow, but a non-Jew. And then the other is 2 Kings 5, where Elisha heals Naaman the Syrian. And Jesus says both of those prophets were sent by God to people who were not Jewish. Now, he says this within a Jewish audience. And what's the reaction to that? Well, all he did was really quote the Old Testament. Both of those accounts are true, and both of them did happen. And that's really all he did was read it and then quoted it. Or, or he quoted it, rather. He explained it. And verse 28 is their reaction to it. All the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. When she says, you have no dealings with, that's really not strong enough. <laughs> it's not simply that they didn't interact with each other. There was great animosity, so much so that simply saying God sent a prophet to Gentiles was worthy of death. See it again in Acts chapter 22. This time the apostle Paul, having been arrested, was explaining, explaining the things that he teaches, explaining how Jesus appeared to him. He's given an account. His conversion happens, is recorded three times, Acts 9, 22, and 26, and this is one of those occasions. And on this occasion, he is explaining what happened and why he's preaching the gospel he preaches, that he wants to oppose it, and now he preaches, and he's explaining how Jesus appeared to him and how the light shined and all of the things that's recorded in Acts chapter 9. Verse number 20, he says, And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. That's Acts 7, and end of 7 and into 8. And he said to me, this is Jesus talking to Saul then of Tarsus, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him up to this statement and then raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. What has Jesus done? Go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and listen to Paul, the apostle, through inspiration, say of Jesus, He is our peace. Whose peace? The Jew and the Gentile. He is our peace who has made both into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. What was that dividing wall? He explains it in verse 15. It was the law contained in ordinances. It was the old covenant law that made them distinct one from another. God did make the Jews, his people. We read that. That's exactly what the Bible says. That law was given to them and them alone. Deuteronomy chapter 5 is very clear. But now in Christ, he has made them both one through the death of our Savior. The you and the we, back up in verses 1, 2, and 3, are now our and us, and we are one in Christ. Why are they one in Christ? Jesus, there's no other reason. The means of that is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus makes this so. Christ died. He rose. The gospel is preached. To whom? To everyone. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. To whom? To everyone. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It was preached to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. It was preached to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. The result is they were both one. Peter would say it this way, Acts 15, 7 through 11. He made no distinction that they will be saved even as we are saved that everybody will be saved the same way. In Christ, 
there is no longer any distinction. The Jews no longer have an advantage. They did, but they don't anymore. And the Gentiles have no lack in Christ. It's all been removed by the gospel. The problem in the first century church to a large degree is that the Jews will not let it go. In fact, some of them have come into the body and intend to keep God's people separate even inside the church. That's Acts 15, verse 1 and verse number 2. They go around saying that if you're a Gentile, you have to be circumcised. In order for you to be saved, you still have to keep the law of Moses. And when you see all of those individuals in Acts 15, they're there refuting that. Peter and James and Paul and Barnabas and the elders are all in that place. And where Paul will say, we didn't give them space, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. The two have become one. Now, when I say that, please understand what that means. If over here we have all the Jews, and if over here we have all the Gentiles, all the other nations that are not Jews, when Jesus dies on the cross, he doesn't make peace with all these people. All these people are not at peace. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and see who is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as the Apostle Paul discusses division within the church and why it ought not to be, it must not be. Well, this is part of the reason. Part of the reason would also be, 1 Corinthians 1.10 is where Paul says that's not supposed to be in Christ. Part of the reason would also be John 17, our Lord prayed for unity, they all be one, and that's what he accomplished. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, notice verse 22. Paul says with regards to the gospel, for indeed the Jews ask for signs. And the Greeks search for wisdom. If you were in Bible class, you heard uh, the teaching about Acts chapter 17 and about the philosophers and, and the Gentiles and their search for knowledge. So over here, the Jews are stumbling. Over here, the Greeks call it foolishness. But notice what Paul says. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But... To those who are the called. How is a person called? 2 Thessalonians 2.14 would say, he called you by the gospel. And so the gospel goes out to the Jews, and some of them obey it. The gospel goes out to the Gentiles, and some of them obey it. What we have now then in verse 24 is that those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. If you came from Judaism into Christ, if you came from paganism into Christ, everybody didn't come. But those who did come, you know what they are? They're at peace. You would have to leave your past, and come in to your present. And then here, everybody would be at peace. That's the force of what Paul says in verse number 14 and 15, that he took from both groups and he made into one. He broke down the barrier. Christ came and fulfilled the law. He took it out of the way. He established a new covenant. See Hebrews 7 through 10. He shed his blood. And so now the Jew and the Gentile in Christ, in fact, he gave them a new name. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, after the Gentiles come in, which is what Isaiah prophesied, for the first time the word Christian is used. It's not used before the Gentiles come in. It's disciples and disciples and disciples. But when the Gentiles obey the gospel, it's Christian. There is a new name for this group of people. And this group of people are now at peace. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All of those nations, well, they keep doing what they're doing. There's war, there's animosity, there's hatred, there's strife. 
but not in Christ. In Christ, they're at peace. You imagine what the first century world would look like when people who came from Judaism left the hostility toward the Gentiles and came into Christ, and people who were Gentiles and hostile toward the Jews came into Christ, and now that group of people are calling each other family, brothers and sisters, and saying to their prospective groups, you're not my group anymore. You're not what's most important anymore. I have a family now that's comprised of God's children, of which I am one, and that's my family. Jews are helping the Gentiles. Gentiles are helping the Jews. Paul is actually gathering money and funds from congregations to help Jewish saints who are hurting for need, uh, need of funds. And Paul is writing about that and encouraging the Corinthians and the Macedonians to help them out and saying to the Jews, well, you have given them their our, our, our earthly spiritual things. They're giving you carnal things. This is now God's family. It's also one more use of the miraculous gifts. One more use of the Spirit's gifts was to help the Gentiles Stand on equality with the Jews. Look over in Galatians chapter 3 and listen to the Apostle Paul as now the, the Gentiles are being asked to, to give up Christ for, for the law and, and submit to what the Judaizers are teaching. He says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 1, you foolish Galatians, who, who's bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Here's his question. This only thing that I would find out from you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being protected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? What does he mean? Verse number five. So then does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? If you were a Jewish individual and you kept trying to hound the Gentile by telling them you are not as you ought to be, what the Gentile would simply have is, I have miraculous gifts too. How did you get them? I got mine the same way you got yours, from the same Spirit. And if the Spirit is giving the gifts, then that means, well, I'm in just like you're in. There is no lack. There is nothing to divide, not anymore. Go back to Ephesians and notice what Paul says in chapter 4, and this is the reason. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, beseech you to walk. Well, that's ultimately where we're going. Because of what God has done, it determines the walk we live. And so I urge you, brethren, I beseech you, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Put that in the first century context of Jew and Gentile being reconciled into Christ. How are we going to get along? with humility and gentleness, with patience, and showing tolerance one for another in love. What will we be doing? Verse number three, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What's the rallying cry? What's the thing that's going to hold us? Verse number four, there is one body and one Spirit. Just as you have been called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in you all, on what then would we be dividing? There is no place. There is only peace. Jesus makes peace between man and man. Friends, no other place and person can do this. 
please stop looking for somebody else to fix what Jesus alone has fixed. The way to solve the issues of the, of the, of the world with regards to their animosity one toward another is in Christ. Amen. Number two, Christ makes peace with God. If we were talking by way of descending order, we would have put this first. It just didn't appear first in the text. But I will also add, do you remember the triangle we talked about? It's always present. There is God, and then there's you, and then there's others. The, re the orders may be occasionally reversed, but it's always the same. Here we're talking about peace between man and man, okay? Well, then that's you and others. Now we're talking about peace between you and God. It's always that way. It just descends that way. Christ makes peace with God, verse number 16, and might reconcile them both. Who gets reconciled? Both. Where? In one body. To whom? To God. How? Through the cross. By having put to death the enmity, he might reconcile, make one again, both into God, the Jew and the Gentile, in one body. It's one of the reasons the church is so significant. Very often we talk about the church, we start in the New Testament. I understand why we do it, because that's when the church begins in Acts chapter 2. I understand that. The challenge is your friends and our families don't understand that. They don't understand that we've been talking about the church since the book of Exodus. They don't understand that Exodus takes us back to Genesis 12 and the promises to Abraham. They don't understand that the promises to Abraham are necessary because of Genesis 3 and because of sin. And they don't understand that the reason we're in Genesis 3 and sin is that God had a plan in eternity. He purposed it. What's that plan? It's the church. The church is the manifold wisdom of God, chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 9 through 11, purposed in eternity. When you and I talk about the significance of the church, it's because the church is Christ's body, and in Christ is where reconciliation occurs to God. And you can't get to God without Christ, and therefore, if you're in Christ, you're in his body. You're in his church. You know how this book opens back in chapter 1. That chapter ends by saying in Ephesians 1, and 23, he has put all things under his feet, giving him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is the body of Christ, okay? Well, what did we just read in verses 14 and 15? He himself is our peace, who have made both groups into one, broke down a bare dividing wall by abolishing his flesh, the image containing a law of the making himself in one new man, so making peace he might reconcile them both under God in the one body. That's how you get back to God. It's through Christ. You can't just dismiss the church of our Lord and call it just one of many, say it's unnecessary any more than you could do that to Christ. Christ is the means of making peace with God. Now, why do you need peace with God? You need peace with God because of sin. When you start to study the subject of sin through the Bible, it will take you a while because there is a lot of information in the Bible on sin. Some of the things that's said about sin is that sin is lawlessness. That's 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. When you hear the word lawlessness, just kind of break the word down and you have an appreciation for what it means. Here is a person who lives outside of the law. He lives as if the law doesn't apply to him. He is lawless. He is outside of it. He is an individual who sees the law, breaks it, and has no impunity about it. What he fails to understand that in so living that way is he does that against God. If there is a law, there is a lawgiver, and the lawgiver is God. And so, David would say it this way, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Sometimes you hear people say, well, you can't judge me. They're not completely wrong. I mean, I'm not the lawgiver. I don't have a—I'm not the judge. And so, if you say to me, Eric, you're in no position to judge me. Now, here's the problem. When they say you can't judge me, they mean and they understand in their mind, nobody can judge me. And if all you're doing is talking about human beings, I'll agree. 
But God can, and God has. If you violate, break God's law, the condition in which you are in, you've done that against God. And so, God can judge. In fact, James says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Well, how did Paul describe them as indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath? Whose wrath? That's God's wrath. You see, sin is lawlessness. That's God's law. Sin is committed against God. That's what you have done. Sin is lived in, walked in, practiced in. You are then living a life of practiced hostility against God. You then made yourself an enemy of God. And as a result of that, you're deserving of His wrath. It's what makes coming to Jesus so necessary because God still loves you. In your practiced hostility, your stiff heart, cold-hearted, you're turning your back. He still loves you. Verse number four of this very chapter said, but God, but God who is rich in mercy, but God who is great love. What did God do? He provided himself a lamb. John chapter one and verse 29 says this of Jesus. The next day John sees Jesus and he said, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. When you see the phrase of God, that is describing ownership, possession. And so, if you can imagine in the Old Testament, if you commit a sin, you take your lamb, your lamb, for your sin. Well, when it comes to reconciliation, what the Bible is describing is Jesus is God's lamb. That God is taking the lamb to do what? Sacrifice. Why? So, you and he, humanity, can be at peace again. Jesus is described as not simply the Lamb of God, He's also described as appeasing God's wrath, 1 John 2, 1 and 2. That His blood then satisfies God's holy requirements, Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. That Christ died once for all for all men, and that God is satisfied through Christ's death, and God is glorified. In fact, with regards to His blood, here is the picture in Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things. That's a reference back to the tabernacle and temple where you had the holy place and the most holy place with a veil separating them. The, the Hebrew writer said, Christ didn't go in there. But Christ went into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. His shed blood is the offering to God to satisfy the requirements and to appease the wrath due man. And so in Christ, we have peace with God. The people that Paul is writing to, the Ephesians, are in Christ. Back in chapter 1, verse 12 and verse 13, Paul talks about those of us who first trusted in Christ. And then he says of them, you also believed. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, saved by grace through faith. You're in him. Chapter 2 and verse 13, but now in Christ. These are individuals who are enjoying the blessing of peace. And so, if we're talking to God's people, we would say, God has made peace between us and each other and us and God. There's always two parts to the sermons. There is this part where you're trying so desperately to encourage God's people and then warn those that are without. Because what if you're not in Christ? How will you satisfy God's wrath? How will your sins be forgiven? How will you make peace with your fellow man? How will you make peace with God? You have to stop believing that you can make peace with God on your terms. And that's largely what the world has decided. 
I've offended God. I've lived a lawless life. I, I've done all these things contrary to him. And now, at some point in my life, I listen to a podcast, and this person really has some good advice. I read a book, and this person really told you how to improve your life. I just started to go to church. And by that, you believe you have peace with God. When the Bible talks about reconciliation, it talks about it in terms of conflict resolution. Relationally, Jesus is your mediator. That is, you and God are at odds in your relationship. And you know what? Jesus is the one who comes and stands between both groups, and Jesus then mediates. Legally, you are a lawbreaker, and thus you live lawlessly. And so, Jesus then is your court-appointed attorney. Jesus is your advocate. Religiously, you're a sinner. And Jesus is your high priest, sacrifice, and Savior. Now, you're trying to get peace with God, and you won't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, what you're doing is you're rejecting God's offer of peace. You're rejecting God's terms of peace. You're rejecting God's appointed person of peace. It's amazing that God is the one injured, and God is the one who provided the lamb. God is the one injured, and God appointed the mediator. God is the one injured, he is the judge, and he appointed the court attorney for you. And at every turn, you keep saying to God, nope, I'll get there on my own. You will not. You will not. You will not bypass Jesus and get to peace with God. You don't have the conditions of peace. You don't have the blood of Jesus that makes peace. In fact, without Christ, there is no peace. Amen. You and God, it doesn't matter how many podcasts you listen to. It doesn't matter how many books you read. It doesn't matter how many self-help gurus you listen to. It doesn't matter how much change you make in your life. Without Jesus, there is no peace with God. And if there is no peace with God, then there only remains animosity, enmity, and at some point, Wrath will be meted out. Number three, Christ provides peace with ourselves. That's verse 17 and 18. Paul says, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers. You once were, you're not anymore, not in Christ. Aliens, but you are now your fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. What does sin do? It robs you of peace in every regard. But it robs you of personal peace. You, the Gentiles, and personally those that you were dead in your trespasses, and so were the Jews. And there is no peace in sin. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, where would we find peace in verse number 3? Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Where would you find peace in that? You won't. Chapter 4 and verse 17, when Paul talks to the brethren, he says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk. How do they walk, Paul? In the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. They have become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every— You know what? You can have a lot of things in that life, but it won't be peace. You have no peace. The world does this amazing trick on God's people. It keeps on. Now, God's people are the possessors of peace, and the world keeps saying, look at us. We're better off than you. They keep saying to God's people, don't you want what we want? 
They keep showing you the smoke and mirrors and the sleight of hand, and you and I keep buying it. And we keep thinking, oh, man, look at that life. If only, if only what? You could go back to being without Jesus? Have you forgotten? Nobody has to twist your arm here. All you got to do is remember what life was like for you without Jesus. Was there a lot of peace back then? David says, for I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. The problem with no peace inside yourself is you take you everywhere you go, and you ain't always good company in sin. Mm -mm. Proverbs 13, 15, the Bible says, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of a transgressor is hard. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 15, 9, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loveth them that follow his righteousness. The foolish man perverted his way, and he, his heart fretted against the Lord. Now, that's the King James language, and you and I don't go around using the word fretteth every day. So, let me read it to you in a couple other versions. Here's one. By his foolish behavior, a man's ways are turned upside down, and his heart is bitter against the Lord. One rendering said, we are ruined by our own stupidity, though we blame the Lord. Another said, people ruin their lives with the foolish things they do and then blame the Lord for it. And I would say amen and amen and amen, because we all walked in it. But then we came to Jesus. And with a changed mind, weren't you glad when you first came out of the water? Can't you remember it? Can't you remember? I've heard people describe it as, I feel light. I've heard people describe it as, I've never felt this good. I, it's all gone. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's all gone. Oh, all of that. There's no peace back there. No, the struggles in people's lives is sin. And it harms the mind, breaks the spirit. Here are a couple of passages from Isaiah chapter 57. As I told the people this morning, let me tell you now, the plane is landing. Uh, we've just entered the airspace of Austin's airport. We're going down. Have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 57, read a couple of passages with me, one on the righteous and one on the wicked, and we'll be done this morning. Isaiah 57, 1 and 2, the Bible says this, The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. Isaiah 57 verse 17 says, Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him. I hid my face and was angry, but he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I've, always, I've seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips, peace, peace, to the far off and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But notice how the verse chapter ends. But the wicked, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet. And its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. What's the blessing of reconciliation? Peace. Christians should live in peace. Because Jesus makes peace. He makes all men one in Christ. Whatever groups we came from, we came into Christ and became family. That's our family now. Jesus does that. Jesus satisfies the wrath of God. God's wrath was meted out on him and in an amazing and an astonishing Worthy of his glory and his praise, God meted out the wrath we were due on his son. Isaiah 53, so he could make peace with us. Jesus makes us at peace with ourselves. 
You know, if you ever ask the question, if you're a Christian, is God angry with me? No, nope. because you're in Christ. Is God's wrath awaiting me? No, because you're in Christ. Has God forgiven me? Yes, because you're in Christ. Am I God's child and a part of his family? Yes, because you're in Christ. And so Paul will exhort in another place, don't worry. Don't let worry or doubt rob you. Philippians 4, 6 through 9, but in everything give thanks, and the peace of God will guard your heart in Christ Jesus. Amen. Friends, this is why you need to obey the gospel. Nobody outside of Jesus Christ can have this peace that Jesus alone offers your problem, if you're not a member of the Lord's body, if you're not a Christian, your problem is sin. It's nothing else. You might want to blame it on something else. And sometimes people talk about the Lord's church and they say things about us as if we're the problem. We call this the invitation. Really, the whole sermon is intended to move a person to a point of decision making to bring them into conflict with their sins and to confront Christ and what he's done and make a decision. That's what the apostles did. That's what the prophets did. That's what we're trying to do. Now, the case may be that you, maybe Eric said it in a way that you didn't like. Well, okay, that's on Eric, I suppose, to whatever degree that is. But listen, Eric's not the problem. Sin is the problem. And you had that before you came. Sin is the problem. Sin's everybody's problem. And Jesus is everybody's solution. So what must you do? The same thing we all must do. We must come to Jesus, meet God's requirements, accept God's grace in the person of Jesus. We sinned. God still loved us. He sent Jesus to make reconciliation for us. You want to be at peace this morning with God? The way to do that is to come to Jesus. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you'd like to read a couple of passages, I would give you Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 following. Uh, Romans 6, 3 through 5 would be good passages to read. Galatians 3, 26 to 29 would be good passages to read. Because two of those passages tell you very plainly how you get into Christ. The Bible will say you need to be baptized to do that. Well, baptism is not the only thing. It's just the last thing. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You change your heart and your mind. You repent. You confess the name of Jesus, and then you're baptized. And when you do that, God, through Christ, puts you into Christ, where the salvation is, 2 Timothy 2.10, where the reconciliation is, where the peace is, where the forgiveness is, where all the spiritual blessings are in there, in Christ. You now have peace. Friends, if you've never done that, every week we preach, we exhort, we bring you to this very point, and we ask, won't you come? The last thing anybody would want is for you to keep rejecting God and enter an eternity without Jesus. If you're a child of God, please never doubt his love, his grace, his mercy, his goodness. Please be at peace. But if you're not, then please run to Jesus before it's eternally too late and you meet his wrath. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as we stand